and you're and live. You're live. Oh, thanks, Dan. Cheers. Hello. Good morning, everyone. What a start. Welcome to the Finkin Show. Thirty minutes or so, we will talk Villa and Forest. All hail the team goal of the Championship season. Distill the Canaries' accounts, sort of, and hear from Stuart Webber, Ed Balls, and Temu Puki. And we will do all this in the company of this week's top double act: Guardian football journalist, Football Weekly podcast pundit, and City fan Paul McInnes, and Eastern Daily Press City columnist David Hannant. Uh, great to have you both on a gentleman sorry about the big intro there Paul but um, that's good um, how are you both doing how are you Paul nice yeah very trip. good very good yeah just um, come down for a couple of days to see the folks and uh, as I was just explaining came over I was at Old Trafford last night very lucky to be at Old Trafford but then managed to get a five hour train from Manchester to Norwich today it wasn't easy but I'm here now we love Norwich for the fact that it's so hard to get to from everywhere else. Uh, David, how are you? It's been a long time. We haven't had you on for, for years. No, I don't think I've, I think this is my debut in this format anyway. Oh. But um, yeah. You're in for a treat. I, I look forward to it. But yeah, no, very well. I, um, I think it must have been part of the excitement of last night, but I'm running on about two hours sleep. So um, it's going to be fun. Yeah. Take note of that, Paul. You're going to be a dad, aren't you? How exciting. Two hours sleep every day. Wow, is that is that what you're you and your dad as well? Oh, no. You're just staying, you're just staying in the I midnight hole. Oh. I have a cat. That's the closest thing. <laughs> as long as it's still alive, you're all right. Uh, brilliant stuff. Uh, so we are live on uh, pinken.com and, of course, the Pinken Facebook page. And we want to hear from you, too, uh, be it on that goal, those wins, Louis's lack of luck, and especially exactly how carried away you are prepared to get so early in the season. I'm talking silly wages, staying in the same underwear, uh, starting a Buy Jordan Rhodes crowdfunding page, or getting Daniel Farkas face tattooed on your backside. Uh, don't worry, they, they have all these, they don't have to be this extreme. Um, you can tell us maybe if you're not that excited as well, because you think we should all uh, grow up and you think it'll all disappear and, and, and uh, fall off a cliff. Either way, we want to hear from you. Tell us about how excited or not you are. You can get through, uh, get those all through to us here in the pub by sending a message on the bottom of the uh, live feed on Facebook and they will pop through to my phone, all being well. Just make sure you do it on the Pinken uh, Facebook page feed because I might not be able to see all the other ones, just to note. Right, let's get on with the usual, uh, shall we? The lethal combination of Wesley Moulihan, who seems to be sitting particularly close to me tonight, and um, on Onel Hernandez, as controlled by Dave Hannant. This is uh, this week's Norwich City Headlines. It's <laughs> a strong start, Dave. Villains of the peace. Sky Sports left to rue their darlings' defeat as City burst Dean Smith's bubble with the best goal ever seen in a scrappy goal of two sides cancelling each other out. I think you were wrong there, Dean. I prefer the first one, Dave. <laughs> F-bomb as Forrest felled. Fortunately, Tim Closer kept it clean in my post-match chat with him after Forrest. Two goals shortly before notching his 100th appearance in midweek. It was the best performance and result of the season until Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> So rich, they'll have to. <laughs> so rich, they'll have spent it by Christmas. Uh, there's a profit in the bank for last season's financial year, but City still expect to be in the red by the time 2019 begins. Let's hope it doesn't mean a big sale come January. I am hopeful. There you go. And finally, <laughs> luck, 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 luck. It gets better, Paul. Don't worry. Luckless Louis. Poor Thompson dislocates his shoulder within seconds of coming on last night. It looks like surgery and several weeks out. Uh, maybe this is all paving the way for Louis to score the goal that sends Norwich up come next year. Hey, get well soon, Louis. One more, Dave. Well done, Sterling effort. You can come back, uh, guys. I'm not going to be. I'm not going to lie. It's been quite a lively few days. We'll start with Villa, shall we? Um, what a performance! What a performance and result, Paul. Yeah, um, I mean, as I've already, I was already discussed. I've, I've, I've barely been in the flesh at all this season because I'm always working with it again. But I try and keep up, and I kept up last night, and I stayed up till half past one in the morning, devouring everything I could about this game because I did not think that would happen, particularly when they went behind. You know, you think to come from behind at the weekend against Forest, who, you know, reading what you're saying about Karanka, I remember that from the Middlesbrough team. It's like, there's, the, there's a bit of brittleness there because they do get a bit cocky, but I thought, you know to do it again was asking a lot and yet you know it, it was it was done with a little bit to spare um, and and with some fantastic football and the confidence 
Who who is it who plays the switch in that in that goal, which I'm sure you'll want to talk about? But there's there's switch from left to right. Is that is that Lightner, 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 Lightner. To, to Max Aaron's yeah. wonderful touch? It's I mean just just a, just a sublime pass that's just completely a different range from all the little ticky tacker stuff that's been going on before that. Just you know they're confident, they're technically capable, and they they obviously believe in the style of football they're playing. Oh, they do indeed. And and to me, Dave, I mean, Villa were very good, I thought, last night. They, they played pretty well, and I'm sure neither side really had that many uh, efforts on goal directly. But in terms of an, a threat going forward and defensively at the back? Yeah, um, yeah, Villa acquitted themselves pretty well, you know, coming up, certainly coming up and going ahead at Carrow, which not too many teams do these days, touch wood. But... Um, I, I didn't think much of Jack Grealish. Kind of for me, you know, you know, he's the one that everybody talks about, Aston Villa, and people were mentioning him in the same breath as James Madison. And I just think I, he spent more time on the turf than on his feet, and just didn't really impress me. But you know, the, the lads up front for, for Villa certainly posed a, a few problems. But I, just, I think like after, as soon as the goal went in, and perhaps after half time, it was all all Norwich. Remember, remember Robbie Brady. Oh, just about. Yeah. yeah. So you know, we had a great season for us in the Premier League. Didn't get his move in the summer. Was not nearly the same player, you know, in that next window before we before we flogged him onto Burnley. And I wonder whether there's a bit of that about Grealish now. You know, he, last season, I'm sure Bruce must have said to him, "Listen, you've got it to be a Premier League player. Come out and show it for us." He did. And then Spurs were sniffing and the deal never happened and now he must be frustrated. Which I would say is the one element of James Madison's sale that people don't talk about. What would have happened if he'd have stayed? You know? It would have been, it would have been a very different um, season, even regardless of his, of his quality. Uh, let's have a look here. We've got some, some uh, comments coming uh, through, uh, which is always nice. Gary Field's waving. Um, Andy Ansel says, hi, Lee. So, yep, good, uh, hi, Lee. Um, <laughs> And uh, some other messages. So, Gary Field, which of the 49 touches, City touches for City's second goal was the best? So, you quite like Leitner's pass? Yeah, I mean, there's another one. There's another good one, but I'll, I'll go for Leitner's pass. I mean, obviously, the last two were pretty good as yeah. well. Yeah, um, Aaron's is control, but I think even... Yes. Um, I think Closer's little through ball for Buendia and the, about three passes from the end was, was up there and you know I, can't, I suppose you can't not mention uh, Tribal's back heel but it was just total football and I think I was talking I think we were chatting earlier in the office about this and how um, it reminded me a lot of Grant Holt's hat-trick goal against Ipswich which you know same kind of thing every player in the squad touched the ball on that you know in the build-up to that goal and People kind of forgot about that one, so I'm glad this one's kind of getting spoken about. Yeah, too true, too true. Uh, what else have we got here? A definite mention from Gary Field, Tom Tribal's or Treble, as Sky say. I think it's Treble, but that's a funny sound, isn't it, really? Um, his cheeky back heel, which was, which was very good indeed. Lovely, and that just, again, just, just shows, or it was the right thing to do because the ball needed to move on, he's getting closed down, which just showed the confidence as well. But, I mean, that, that Jordan Rhodes finish, I mean, that is... You can't really, I mean, maybe you can, but it doesn't feel like you can teach that. That's like, you know, that's the sort of thing instinct, you've got to instinct and you've got to believe you can do it. It's such an amazing, like, so the angle's so tight. It all happened so quickly. I, I'm down the other end of the ground. I sit up the upper river end. And until I saw, um, you know, obviously the cheer came and the, the net bulged, I didn't, even, I could barely even make out how it happened. It all happened so quickly. It's like, how did that end up in the back of the net? But obviously we've seen it back and I know how. And terrific goal. It's the sort of goal you wonder whether he would have scored if he hadn't already got the first. Fair point. And indeed, uh, 16 games, seven goals. He's already averaging. Obviously they're coming in burst, but that's not the point. So we'll take them all. Um, brilliant. Let's... Uh, we should touch on Nottingham Forest as well but maybe before we do that Louis Thompson let's just mention Louis because I think it was 13 seconds he was on the pitch and it seemed such a shame because it, these injuries aren't really connected to say the past operations and things like that it's just extraordinary bad luck yeah I mean absolutely and and you know you cross your fingers he's, he's still young and, yeah. and, and, and at least it's not a recurring injury and at some point you think well maybe his luck will turn good and, and what is clear you know Farker talking to you guys last night specifically about him you know he's he, he is respected in the club valued in the club and he has a role to play you know signing that new five-year contract they want him there they want him to play so you know it, it'll probably be a few weeks out maybe a month 
and, and, and then he'll start again. But, you know, yeah, it's, it's Sod's law. But I think in the long term, he's still got a lot to be optimistic about. I find it, I find it really interesting, the, the kind of contrast in reactions um, between Louis Thompson's injury problems and Matt Jarvis's. Because, um, you know, if Matt Jarvis were to have come on the pitch after months out and suddenly picked up an injury in 13 seconds... I'm not sure we'd be sitting here saying, well, I, not myself, but I'm not sure, pe- sure others may be sitting there not saying, oh, how unlucky, but saying, oh, for goodness sake. And I kind of feel that Matt Jarvis is a bit hard done by in that sense because it's the same situation. They're both, you know, just really unlucky. And, you know, I hope both of them can see through. Um, wonderful win at Forest, too, in terms of the way they went about that. I've got um, two players that I, you can talk about, Jordan Rhodes or Moritz Leitner. You can pick which one you want to talk about, but I think Dave wants to talk about Mo. <laughs> Absolutely. But yeah. Like yeah, no, I mean, I, I think I was asking, because um, I've probably seen Leitner in the flesh half a dozen times, and uh, when I've seen him, it was mostly at the back end of last season where he was almost playing in that Steeperman role, a sort of little bit further forward and sort of looking for those through balls. And I was asking my brother about, you know, what, what was he was raving about him. I said, well, particularly that he was, he was doing. And it was, it's, just, it's, the, it's that sort of metronomic Tony Cruz, maybe, you know, like he, he, he just keeps the play going and always knows what the options are on the pitch and finds them and then but then you know we're talking just now he's also playing the imaginative ball as as well um i know bethnal yellow and green a guy i follow on twitter who's a very smart guy don't know who he is but but he's a smart guy and and he was like you know when he, he follows german football and it was when he was retweeting himself basically reminding everybody that he got it right and when he said <laughs> and when mo Leitner signed permanently or also signed on loan he's like he's too good for the championship and he has that grace you know, and technical ease, which is sort of suited to the top flight, I think. I've, I've almost likened it to that he's doing half of the job James Madison was doing in terms of the possession yeah. and giving it, but giving everyone else the opportunity to do the other half, which is basically to finish chances off and, and chip in with the goals. And one of the things I, I, um, I bumped into, I bumped into, I actively sought him out because I was at a thing, an event in London, and Stuart Weber was there giving a talk about the bond. And, you know, obviously that went well for them. It's a bit of a gamble, went well. So now everybody wants to hear the genius of, you know, how they raised five million pounds in five minutes. And I was, I was you know, just talking... Except for proper fan base, first of all. Well, yeah, well, <laughs> indeed, indeed, exactly. Although he was saying that some of these people were just kind of actually not Norwich fans who were looking for a, a decent investment. But, um, so, you know, talking to him, you know, he, he, he said something t- uh, which I kind of thought was the case but hadn't heard explicitly was that, you know... It was brilliant having James Madison last season and he was a great player, but everything went through him. And there was a sort of a, a, a you know, that, so it's a bit like a funnel. If, if There were some games, not many, but there were some games when he wasn't on his A game and then Norwich struggled because he didn't know where else to go. This season, that's not the case. You know, obviously, Leitner does a great job and is enabling people all over the pitch, but, you know, we've got other players who can make it, you know, steep him in. The contribution he's making in the in the in the opposition yeah, half. Yeah, well, that's I was you know gonna thinking on the way here, saying exactly something along the same lines about James Madison, because when you have got a player of that quality, that talent, who you know you expect something to happen every single time he touches the ball, of course the temptation is going to be there to go through them every time. And if you know if if our players know that's what they're going to do, the opposition sure as hell know that's what we're going to do as well. And then you know all you find is people doubling doubling up on on Madison and you know in a weird way I think more ways than, than not it's actually been a blessing in disguise selling him um, you know under all the circumstances you know selling him to Leicester a club who are obviously going to flog him on to Liverpool or someone for 50 million in a couple of years time so he's another whack there and yeah that's and I think Leitner he's a special player I think last season there were times when him and Madison did want to occupy the same space they both wanted the ball every time they both wanted to you know, drop deep but make things happen. Um, and just that now Light, Lightner's kind of the main man in City's midfield, he's flourishing. He looks, you know, he just has so much time on the ball. He doesn't get flustered, you know, whoever's bearing down on him. And he always picks a brilliant pass and he also does something well with it. And he's kind of, full, like, you know, I think you all know how hard I took it when Wes left. He's kind of filling that void in, in a way. 
At least your cat survived that moment. That's good. Um, <laughs> um, yes, Moritz Leitner, absolutely. Just don't see him give the ball away. So long may that continue. Um, Mark Davies has been in touch. Getting over, he's getting over losing Bowen and Culverhouse. Now we've got Jamal and Max. I'm sure we will talk about that in a moment. So uh, this morning also saw City's accounts for the past financial year revealed. We've got a bit now uh, from Stuart Webber and Ebb Balls and what they had to say about the whole uh, numbers. At the moment we were relegated from the Premier League back in 2016, we faced a huge fall in our income because the loss of the TV rights which come in the Premier League, and you get parachute payments, in our case only for two years, and they've now run out. So these annual accounts are based upon um, a parachute payment still of over £30 million, and even that was much lower than we faced before. That's gone now. So huge fall in income, and our task as a football club and as a board has been to deal with that big loss of income while making sure that we can still be both financially sustainable and competitive on the pitch. And that's about generating other income, it's about reducing costs, particularly on the, the football side, um, which Stuart Webber has led, big fall in the overall wage bill, but at the same time, making sure our transfer policy and our academy policy makes us competitive on the, the pitch. And I think if you look at the way the team's performing at the moment, the competition for players, the new academy players coming through, you can see that we're ambitious, but we're also making sure the sums add up. Fundamentally, if we hadn't done that dealings, we probably wouldn't be stood here now, or, or the club would look significantly different um, in terms of you know what we would have gone through. Um, so we're grateful that we got them deals done. Even more grateful we got them done pretty early in the window so that we could then invest in the squad to give ourselves the best or give Daniel the best possible squad that we could give him because you know that's really important that here we're balancing our financials against you know still being a football club of which people want to come and watch the team be successful mm -hmm. um, you know it'd be really easy just to you know, solve it by just sell all your best players and then put a rubbish team out on the pitch getting that balance has been really hard so um, we were really grateful that we got them deals early so we could at least try and improve Daniel's squad to give us the best chance of having the best season we can. I first came to a game here uh, in 1973, aged six years old, and all my life this has been a football club which has found great talent, has done well on the pitch with new talent, but also there have been players who were, were sold, and that's just the nature of football at a club like uh, this. Um, clearly, um, over the last few seasons, as we've, as a, you know, this massive fall in revenue, of course, the money which has come in from the sale of the Murphy twins, from James Madison, from Robbie Brady, um, um, you know, all deals where we made um, a profit, of course that's important for us as a football club. But you know, in the end, the thing which we're judged on is not the bottom line. We've got to be financially sustainable, sustainable but we're judged as a football club by what happens on the pitch. And um, if we had taken the money in June and said we're shutting up shop, then people might have felt disappointed. But if you actually look at the flow of players who then came in in July and August and are not yet in these financial accounts because mm. that's charging this financial year, you can see that um, we were looking to find value to play here at Carrow Road. In terms of the James Madison deal, uh, I described it to people, it's like playing an unbelievably high stake poker game um, where you know you've got to sell him, um, but you can't let them know you've got to sell him, but you've got to try and you know play people off against each other a little bit. And, and like I say you've got to play poker. It was difficult. I think we can be really proud as a club. The, the deal we got for him was a record for a player moving from the Championship who'd never played previously in the Premier League. And you know, I don't think that should be dismissed too lightly. I think that's, uh, you know, it's not e easy to achieve the figure that we did for him. And then the same with Josh. You know, I think if you look um, for a homegrown player to have come all the way through, uh, to have played 100, over 100 games for this club and then sell him for that, I think is you know, what a great success story. And it's something that the whole club and, and Josh and his family should be really proud of. Because um, you know we certainly are. These accounts reflect the first payments from the sale of James um, Madison and Josh Murphy back in June. They also reflect for the last financial year the money coming in for players like Rob B Brady, but also money still going out for players we signed in the Premier League. And um, the next year or two, we'll have the same thing going on. Um, what we've got to do is carry on what I think has been a brilliant transfer policy in the last year from Daniel Fark and Stuart Webber, reducing the costs bringing in new talent clearly where we can. If there's a player who wants to play in the Premier League and somebody's going to pay £20 million for them to do so, clearly as a football club we have no choice but to say yes to that. That's the only way in which we can make this um, work but we're looking to find the new stars and uh, if you said to me back in July we'd have academy players playing at right back, left back and central midfield, I wouldn't have expected that. So that's great news for the future of this football club.
Well, seamless, Dan. Thanks for that. I've got no idea how that, how that looked for everyone else, but I'm sure it was great. It's the last time I buy you a pint of cider. Um, so uh, keep your messages and comments coming in. Um, I, some of them appear to have dropped off, which is a bit annoying, so I, I'll get to as many as I can. I know a few people have been asking what result we want from the Leeds-Ipswich game. We'll tease that for a minute. Hold, hold that thought. Um, in terms of the account situation, it seems like Norwich have got a lot of money, but they've got to pay it off and, and still owe more anyway come the, the new year. So is there an acceptance around the place of Norwich's situation now, maybe compared to 12 months ago? I, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm one of these guys, I'm a bit... I have controversial opinions about the atmosphere in Carrow Road. And, and I know that it was really good last night, so that's great. I love that. And, and I, think, I think ultimately the, the truth is... Results will dictate whether people are relaxed about it or not. If we're doing well, then they'll think our strategy in place. If we're doing badly, it'll be like, where's the money gone? So, you know, I, 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 think, I think, yeah, we have problems. And I, and I think, and I think what, you know, the, the further we get away from it, you can see that that last McNally period, you know, that, that window in January in the, in the Premier League was a disaster. And, and uh, you know, not only did it not work in terms of staying in the division, it tied us to several players who we spend a lot of money on, who, whose wages haven't seemed to have come down since we've got relegated. And, but the good news is that those contracts are, you know, we, we've you know, agreed to deal with Russell Martin. Stephen Naismith is coming to an end. I think you know, so these these sorts of Matt Jarvis as well. Will soon you know, the, 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 these are big deals that will soon be off the books and and will be on the level playing field. The Weber plan that will be consistent across the piece. So we can sort of start again. Obviously, we all hope. You know, we 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 we've either you know maybe we might have a cut one. You know, maybe yes. we might we maybe we might get money. We're in the middle of one, Paul. We're in the middle of one. You know, we beat we beat Bournemouth, and you know, or, or, it's it's a it's a it's big time. Be a distraction. Yeah, no, well, no. <laughs> true, um, but, you know, there are ways of making money, but it, there aren't necessarily promotion. But obviously, we got promoted, and nobody has to worry about anything. The, the, the story changes drastically. Um, and Dave, in terms of because we were discussing this when um, we we got sort of a heads up on what the accounts were going to look like, yeah. so we could obviously prepare what we were going to do. There weren't that many surprises, and that almost says a lot about, I guess. A, a degree of transparency that's going on at the club that we kind of all know roughly what the situation is. I suppose. Yeah, and that, that's something that certainly Stuart Webber's brought um, since he's come into the club, and I think that's that's great. I mean, personally, as a fan, I don't tend to pay all that much mind to matters off the pitch. You know, my number one concern is how Norwich City play on the pitch, what happens on the pitch, and you know, as long as the club is still afloat and isn't going about to go out of business, then. Um, you know, I'm happy for the, the football on the pitch to, to kind of do the talking. But, you know, it is always positive to see um, someone so open and honest and, you know, not really dodging questions or sidestepping anything to that effect that, you know, you may have seen in regimes in the past and not really knowing what necessarily goes on behind closed doors. But, you know, Stuart Webber, he's, he's, he's very um, switched on, but he's also... You know, if he answer, ask him an honest question, he's going to give you an honest answer. How does it compare with the rest of the championship, Paul, as you look across it? Because you, you see so many... Well, there are sides that are trying to tighten their belts and some who said they were going to, like Derby, and then didn't bother and got Frank Lampard in. And, and the others that are still chucking a shed load of money at it. I mean, Villa, for example. It's, it's like half of them want to do it the way Norwich are doing it, but then if you don't have to, why would you, I guess? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the... the my, my, my knowledge is not it's not perfect but I would say you know the closest we've you know to Norwich is Brentford you know that they've got a, they've got a strategy I, I, I don't know that all that many clubs in the championship have a strategy for success I think you've certainly got you know teams like Rotherham they, they've got they've got a strategy for sort of league one to championship and that's a different game from the one we're in but the the, the, the t- championship to Premier League, there's so much money being speculated you've got it is really you look at it and the championship is sort of the sixth biggest league in Europe so there are you know when you look at what happened with Villa Villa were one of the oldest biggest names in English football so it's an exception but they've been able to go from American owner the Chinese owner to American and Chinese you know (laughs) Owner. International owners. International owners with billions behind them. You know, it's a real... These people are playing a different game to the one Norwich can play. And I, 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 I buy into the strategy, I think, because, because A, I think it can work. 
because I think there's always going to be a tier of player who want developing. They want, you know, they don't, they're not ready to make the big money move yet, and they want to develop and or restart their career, like you see with a tri- triple or a, uh, yeah. let's see, got it now, yeah, uh, with a triple or a Molina. Um, but but the, then, but there's 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 also uh, there's also the capacity for that to sort of uh, succeed. And uh, in, in a division on a you know one-off season, if you get the right if you get the right balance, and I, I think it can. Sorry, what I mean to say is, I think it can work over the long term. If if you have to recycle players and recycle coaches, as long as you understand that this is your basic principle, we're going to have one kid from the academy coming through each year, and we want to play as many academy players as we can, and we are going to buy young hungry players who might have either fallen by the wayside or wanted to kick on. That's a strategy for me. Uh, Lee Boswell says money in the championship is getting insane um, Adam Hipkin when we go up <laughs> when we go up will we stick with our philosophy of buying players with something to prove or will we start wasting money again on prima donnas I mean quite 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 a, a, a accurate a, accurate a narrow description if some would say accurate yeah, I mean sorry to hog this Dave just, but just quickly the Bournemouth you know we play them in the, we play them in the, uh, the Carabao Cup that they are, a, you know, they've stuck by their principles, the, 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 largely because they trust Eddie Howe so much, and they're still, you know, they are buying players who have got the right technical abilities and the physical abilities that they want to play the style of football that they want to play. That is a strategy. You know, if we go up into the Premier League with Farker Ball or, or, or whatever, you know, if we stick to that style, we want to play. Delia wants to play offensive, good technical football. If we lose Daniel Farker, but we still have a coach who wants to do that, which is what Brentford do as well, then there's no reason why you can't do that in the Premier League. You throw me off that completely. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Dave. No, I think, I think he's totally right about someone like Bournemouth being a model for us. You know, they haven't kind of betrayed their principles and okay you know when they've taken in the time they've been in the championship uh, Premier League sorry they've taken a couple of fun pigs when they've tried to play against the bigger teams but those aren't the games that keep you in the Premier League and I think we actually have seen when we've come under Daniel Farker even last season which was a bit of you know a write off um, when we came up against Premier League opposition we didn't look a million miles away like in terms of the style of play it might even suit the champ Premier League better so uh, Lee Boswell says we were never going to get rid of Farker would have been a major embarrassment for Weber I'm not sure that's really much praise in there but there we go that's Lee's opinion um, uh, Johnny Sa- Johnny Scanlon I think that's right Johnny or Scanlon one or the other Johnny definitely got Johnny uh, hello from New Zealand he says and uh, John Page at the moment this is the best feeling I have Norwich City are going places so exciting to watch right now it's nice, nice there. A little buzz around the place you've got to enjoy it you've got to enjoy it uh, right, let's have a little break from all the uh, questions and get on with a bit of this, Dan. Oh uh, yeah, you thought these guys were here to talk about Norwich City or keep an eye on the Spurs game, but actually, actually, it's a VT again. <laughs> oh no, 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 they can't see you, Paul, but I could. Um, this is the bit where we play flip the bird. That's why the gents are here. Um, Dave, you're going to have to knock down your house of cards as well, or house of beer mats, which was very impressive, by the way. So uh, anyway, um, last time out, last time out, Neville Townsend and Chris Elliott added their names to this season's mid-table runners. Chris winning on the night, 6-5. Uh, tonight, it's another pair of debutants wishing they'd never agreed to come on in the first place. Um, so there we go. In short, the guys have 30 seconds to flip as many bar mats as possible, adding one to their flipping pile with each successful one-handed catch. Both scorers will find their way onto our leaderboard, while the winner tonight will get a much prized selfie with Wesley Moulahan, although I keep forgetting to make that actually happen, so we'll have to try and do it uh, tonight. Gents, are you ready? You ready? You need your pile. I can't even do one, so I mean, <laughs> don't know why you're trying to rig it. Ha- I have seen practice. It, it was frightening. <laughs> um, so there's your pile, Paul. Um, Dave's you. ready to go. Oh, Dan's got the timing. Dan's ready. Three, two, one, go. And away we go. Paul going for some serious air on the on the flip there. Dave just monotonously ticking them on. Um, <laughs> Paul's going for the big catch. I mean, there's a lot of flamboyance in how Paul is doing this. Dave's just relentlessly knocking him over. Um, <laughs> Paul, yeah, that's a little flick. A little flick, little flick, little flick from, from... I feel like we should give some, Paul some coaching. Dave, you should probably stop and give Paul some coaching. Um, that was very quick. 
Dave. They can have one for Dave. that. Have one for that because he, 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 Dave, Dave scuppered that. That was what he did to me today in this challenge. First, he pushed my pile away. Then he knocked my cards. So you can have you can have three for that. Oh, Dave. thank you. That was a little bonus one there for, for Dave's interaction. What did you get, Dave? Nine. Nine. That's no, four. <laughs> Maths. Good job you weren't doing the city accounts. Uh, so there we go. Four, three. Um, uh, you know that was. As, that was entertaining. That was entertainment. That exactly. was. That's what it's all about. Liverpool, Newcastle, nineteen ninety-seven. Is it? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Terrible yeah, defending, but really entertaining. <laughs> uh, right. Well, that was exciting. Um, now, um, more flip the bird next week. If I can, you know, recover. Dan's just grinning uh, um, aimlessly. Right. Uh, after all that excitement, let's spend a bit of QT with our guests, shall we? Um, Paul. You are a championship correspondent, although you did get to go to the Champions League, on a national newspaper. Yes. That strikes me as probably quite unusual. There's not many of them. No, the, um, well, no, the, the Sun do it very well. I'm not usually one to rave about the Sun, but the Sun do it very well. But yeah, you're right. The, 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 as, as I'm sure you're aware, budget gets squeezed in journalism all the time. And one of the first things to go is the thing that's not on telly, or people aren't watching in big numbers, and that's, that's the championship. So, um, and, you know, my... my, my I, I'm, I'm made to go around the country doing lots of different sports divisions, so it's not always the championship. But you know, I do get to I do get to write about the championship. And as I said before, I, I, with the six biggest league thing, like the quality in this division is. If you think back to the worthy days, you know, it's it's, it's light years away now, um, and, and and it's a really interesting division because not only do you have you know different owners business models and stuff you have different styles you have different traditions you have uh, a, 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 you know different sort of clubs on the up clubs on the down end um, but really uh, <clears throat> it still remains despite all that you know incredibly unpredictable and I think this year even more so I mean you just don't have that one club which like you know the Jorge Mendes project last year at Worlds you don't have that this year and so it, it's really up for grabs and I think you know there's a top nine there and probably every one of those has a reasonable amount of confidence that they could be in the automatic places and any of the top 23 can probably stay up yeah <laughs> well said Dave we'll be getting on to that in a bit don't worry um uh, there's almost a Norwich Mafia in, in London, isn't there? I think that's always been a bit of a joke in the media. That we, you know, there's, if you get around, even on Football Weekly, it's yourself and um, Mel Rudd were, were on. Mel Rudd were on it. Charlie Wyatt of the Sun. Um, uh, there is McDennis, obviously. Um, yeah, no, I don't think there's that much of a mafia, but, the, but, but there is, but you know, but cultured people, i.e., those who support Norwich City, you know. Sometimes you know they they progress out into the wider world and and they and they pop up, but um, yeah no it's it's not it's always I mean for me the biggest fan mafia in football journalism is West Ham, I mean there's about there's hundreds of West Ham fans in in uh, and they're all kind of like uh, they're always looking to uh, yeah all, yeah anyway always looking to moan basically our, our photographer Paul Chesterton top photographer top man as well he's a West Ham fan so but we, he's basically a Norwich fan now. I think we've turned him. We've turned him round. Yeah, Norwich does have that effect on people. <laughs> and also, I mean, you were the guy who wrote the Guardian um, Championship, Championship preview, preview. and did, that didn't mention Norwich in it. No, Paul, shocking! It. What are you doing, lazy journalism? Well, it's lazy <laughs> journalism. Well, people did say this, and they were like, you know, you, you haven't mentioned half the teams. And it's like, well, yeah, you know, the constant frustration as a journalist is like, I was told not to. You know, I was asked have some have some people who are up for automatic, have some people who are up for the playoffs and have some people who might be getting relegated and you know the rest we're not worried about because we're trying to get a general audience but you know hey ho yes I didn't mention them all and I didn't mention Norwich I didn't mention Norwich because um, I'm an optimist about Norwich I'm always an optimist about Norwich I've loved the Farker and Revolution since it started I think it's the right idea I really think they're good good men who want to do the right thing for the football club I think Dealey is a great owner and I really want to succeed but I know that there was a lot of scepticism so I didn't want to I didn't want to either feed into the scepticism and I didn't want to kind of either rave about it and even amongst my friends I said top 10 finish I, I would hope for a top 10 finish and I still kind of that would still be if we get a top 10 finish this season that's improvement on last that's still all right but you know where we're looking at now you know Norwich have a good Norwich have a set up an organization a squad that's ready to do well in this division I'd picked out for people you know 
competing for the for automatics, I picked up Middlesbrough and West Brom. I thought those those were the two that for me West Brom had the West Brom had the had the feel good. You know, they were all behind their coach and they'd all stayed on board. From, there was, there was, I think it was Dawson wanted to quit. There was only about one or two kind of people who were kind of chucking their toys out of the pram. Middlesbrough had Pulis, who knows this, you know, who knows how to kind of organise a team. And win ugly. And win ugly. Um, so I kind of thought those two, and I still, you know, West Brom obviously vulnerable defensively. That's what's become apparent in these games. You know, I was at the game at Carroll Road and it was apparent then. But that, that's maybe their, their weakness that I hadn't quite anticipated because him being a centre-half and them having so many good centre-halves. But that's, that's where they're at. But Middlesbrough are top of the division right now. Leeds, I said, you know, could go either way and will probably go one way and then retreat. And that's commonly what's happening. Uh, uh, Stoke, I said, I don't trust Gary Rowett. I, I don't, I, I haven't, I, 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 his derby, I thought, were underwhelming for what they had. I think... Frank Lampard's derby they're going to go up and down like that because they've got got good players but their manager's learning the ropes so you know currently I kind of look at my predictions and I feel I'm just about alright but maybe I should have put Ipswich in the relegation candidates I will remind you of them all from the end top man um, Dave Norwich City column I'm sure you're really enjoying it pinken.com Eastern Daily Press and lots of people out there who want to do the same thing though so have you got any tips for them or how have you found doing it um I love it. It's one of the highlights, you know, and it's, I quite enjoy sharing the column with, with Ian Clark as well because we kind of, we're both quite like-minded in the way that we are City fans, so it's nice to have a little bit of consistency. We're both kind of optimists, but it also kind of adds to the, the office banter, I suppose, in some sense because you chat about what your columns are going to be or whatever. Um, but, yeah, I, I, advice. I suppose um, prepare yourself to have a bit of a thick skin um, because... You, you do often find that um, you know having a different opinion with somebody about football is sometimes tantamount to insulting their mother you see with some of the reactions you get but um, yeah it's just nice to be able to let let things off your chest when it does come about thing me rather than just flooding your Twitter feed because obviously you know in my day job I tend to write about councils and local government and um, you know it's nice to have that slight outlet I suppose kind of a little bit different variation to the job and but I just think be vocal about if you're passionate about Norwich City be vocal about that fact you know things like Twitter and Facebook or whatever social media get your opinion across get involved in debates and you know that's kind of a way to show that a you can string two words together and b um, you know that you've got something to say that's worth hearing stuff though and also find a niche I know you were you were retweeting somebody last night about the NF, NCFC numbers account I hadn't seen that before this season I think it's new and it's good you know it finds little angles on Norwich City stuff and it does it a bit differently some incredible statage yeah. incredible statage and, and they do well for plugs as well so yeah doing alright um, brilliant stuff um, if anyone's wondering Spurs have just um, conceded a late equaliser they're down to 10 men against PSV dramatic but stay with us, um, obviously. Now, uh, it was a big blow at the time, uh, even though City have coped so far well enough without him. Timu Puki is currently out with a thigh injury, but was still able to help open Park Farm's new Scandinavian cabins, as well as mark the hotel's char- charity partnership with Keeping Abreast. My esteemed colleague David Freezer caught up with the man himself. Timu, well, uh, the Scandinavian lodges at, at Park Farm then. Uh, obviously, you guys come here as a team, don't you, for your team briefings? What do you make of these new, uh, new lodges? Yeah, I like I like them. Uh, it's a uh, really nice looking looking uh, lodges, and uh, yeah, it reminds me a little bit of home as well. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, I think it's really cool to have uh, this kind of uh, stuff here. Okay, well, you're you're from Finland, aren't you? But you obviously lived in Denmark for quite a yeah. long time as well. So uh, yeah, um, is Finland technically Scandinavia? We weren't sure. No, no, it's not. <laughs> uh, when when they said <laughs> over there, I was like. I wanted to say we are not uh, technically in the uh, in the right. Scandinavia, but we are we are pretty similar like people, but the language is totally different. That's probably the biggest uh, difference between uh, the Scandinavian and the Finnish people. Okay, well we're speaking to you the the day after the Aston Villa game. I mean, you you were sat behind the dugout, I think, yeah. weren't you, for the game? So how uh, impressed with last night's performance were you? Yeah, I think we totally deserved to win, and uh, we were the better team. Uh, I think that that was also in a Nottingham game, 
and uh, we are on a good run now so I, I hope we can keep keep doing this and yourself of course um, an injury problem at the moment how, how are you getting along how's the, how's the recovery coming yeah I'm getting along better and better all the time it's been now a bit over a week that, that I get injured and uh, and I'm already uh, jogging and, and running so that's a good sign and uh, I hope I could be in, uh, on the pitch uh, soon, soon, as soon as possible. Is the weekend perhaps going to be a little bit too soon, though? Yeah, I think that that might be too too soon to on oh, no, Saturday. Okay, well, um, you must be pleased for. I remember speaking to Jordan after the Wickham game, and um, he was saying how you guys get on very well. So, were you, you pleased for him to, to see him get a couple of goals last night? Yeah, for sure. Uh, he he totally deserved it to to get those goals yesterday. He worked hard and. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm happy for him, and uh, and uh, I hope uh, hope he, he can do it on Saturday again. Okay, you, you come here today to sort of help out with um, as well as one of the club sponsors partners as, as a charitable element to this as well. So how are you how are you settling into to Nor- Norfolk life generally? Are you, are you settling in nicely? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I have a fiance and a small small baby with me, and uh, and they also they they like their city and. Uh, and we we haven't have so so much time to to see because there's so many games here in yeah. England, <laughs> and uh, but we like it and the weather has been crazy good as well so so that's a big plus. Absolutely, I mean you've lived in what, Scot- Scotland, Germany, Denmark. So, so how, how does it compare to to the other places you've been in your career? Yeah, it's this is not the the biggest city. Uh, I've I've lived in pretty big cities before always, uh, but uh, I think it's more more quiet and I I actually like it and. Uh, and yeah, it's nice, nice city. I like. Okay, just to, to go back on your injury when you picked it up, and yeah. fortunately, Finland still got a, a very good result that night. So, how how much are you enjoying joining up with your your national team at the moment? Yeah, lot. Uh, we have had some uh, hard times uh, in my my time in the national team, and and now we finally uh, keep winning. Over there, there was uh, so that's always uh, a kind of honor to go go with the national team and. Uh, and especially now when we we have something to play for, yeah. And you've got a couple of tough away games in the next break, and uh, as long as your your injury is yeah. sort of all okay. So I think I'm right in saying, do you need one more point, and then you've won won the group? Yeah, I think that's that's how it is. Uh, yeah, one point against Greece or Hungary away both. So it's not going to be easy, but but I think with the confidence we have over there as well, uh, it's well, it's possible. And that must be a really big deal because Finland have never qualified for a major tournament, have they? Yeah, no, no, we have never been, and uh, yeah, it doesn't mean yet that if we win the group that we will be in the in the Euros either. But uh, that's something, something I have never experienced with the national to, to win something, to win the group, and uh, and that's uh, that there's a chance to go go Euros uh, because of this. Absolutely. Um, to look ahead to the Brentford game, um, their new manager Thomas Frank. I think he's a he's a guy you know quite well from from yeah. Bromby, isn't he? Yeah, I was uh, working with him two years, yeah. one and a half years, and uh, and uh, then he came. I think he came to Brentford after that quite fast. He's been here quite long as an assistant yeah. coach or something. And yeah, I know him. He he's a good coach and uh, he he likes to play football as well on the ground. So I think it would be a really interesting game on Saturday. So was he the coach who brought you in from Celtic? Yeah, he was the coach. The thing, yeah. um, so, what, how do you think he'll um, he'll get on at Brentford? Do you think, in terms of style of play, will it? Do you not expect too much to change at Brentford because they're quite an, an attacking team, aren't yeah. they? Uh, I haven't seen so much uh, actually Brentford play yet, so I don't know <laughs> how they play. But uh, but yeah, I think uh, he also been working with the uh, ex manager uh, already, so I think they probably have a similar similar system. So I think they will come with the same same game. Okay. Well, just finally, then I guess you guys are just looking forward to all the games at the moment because it feels like the um, the spirit in the dressing room is is very united and that you're all getting on very well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. There's uh, many games and uh, we're playing well uh, at the moment. So, so all the all the guys are really looking forward to play again. And, uh, and yeah, yeah, like you said, we get uh, well together, really along together. So it's a good group of guys and uh, and we we are. Really enjoying playing together and spending time time together. Top man, thank you, teammate. Thanks. Um, so uh, the championship is actually halfway through its midweek fixture program. Um, let's have a look at where we are at the moment. Uh, Swansea and Millwall produced comebacks of their own last night, while Saturday's Carrow Road visitors Brentford will have uh, have trekked all the way to Preston tonight. Ipswich are also in action this evening with a game at Leeds that could quite possibly be Paul Hurst's last game in charge. 
Um, so as things stand before tonight's results, Ipswich are bottom with Villa stuck in 16th, but a lot can change come 10 p.m. And at the top end, the worst Norwich can drop is to 6th, and the biggest gap to top spot they could face is three points. As things stand, only Birmingham have picked up more points in their last six games than the Canaries. As for the weekend, Leeds Forest should be a late cracker, while the early kickoff at the Riverside shouldn't be bad either. Four days after Norwich face the Bees, they have their Carabao Cup fourth round tie at Bournemouth. Uh, we've already spoken quite a lot about uh, the championship, I think, but in terms of Ipswich, Dave, I'll come to you. I'll ask you about this one. Um, I mean, if if they lose tonight, Paul Hurst doesn't, you know, see out the next few games. Would that be a, it'd be a massive surprise? It'd be quite a statement as well from Ipswich's owners. Yeah, it certainly would be. I mean, personally, I think he's doing a a cracking job. Um, <laughs> but that's just me. Um, it's it's actually. And sorry to just shamelessly plug my column, but um, anyone you know pick up tomorrow's. Uh, EDP Evening News uh, is in there somewhere at the back. Um, I, I talk about patience and something you know that um, Norwich have shown over Daniel Fuck. You know there were there were a few weeks ago you wouldn't have to look too far to find someone calling for his head. Um, but yeah, there's just something wretched about Paul Hurst's you know time in charge at Ipswich. Um, I don't know, nine points from their first thirteen games. You know it's not a good enough return. But rock bottom of the league. Um, it's a hard situation because it could, you know, sticking with someone could pay off. Something could click into place, but there doesn't seem to be that sign of it. But Say that, they'll probably win 3-0 tonight. Yeah, yeah. I think <laughs> the words careful what you wish for come, in, come to mind with Ipswich, to be honest, because Mick McCarthy, you know, is nigh on turning water into wine for doing what he did at that club, you know, keeping them there with very very little money um, so yeah and all those calling for his head I suppose careful what you wish for um, I was going to ask you who I, who your dark horse this season is but maybe we should just call it Norwich and, and move on from there so <laughs> but, but it's a good point you make about Birmingham you know given given their transfer embargo chaos at the club Gary Monk is making a good team out of them and, and I've been I've been a big skeptic Blackburn and Wigan both as well um, a couple of messages as I said apologies they're not all come, oh, I've lost a few of the early ones which isn't great uh, Lauren Smybert hope Dennis Trebeni gets his chance soon uh, do you think the board will let an investor come in or is it just talk I think it's just talk but there is a place on the board of course um, free after Steve Stone's exit uh, that's all I'm going to say on that one I don't know is the honest answer uh, Stephen Simmons uh, having proven goal scorers is making a difference this season Liam Page having three strikers in Shabani, Rhodes and Pookie all scoring is something no other club in the championship or country has makes the difference interesting Daniel Farker said last night in fact he confirmed I told the strikers I want you to score 30 goals for us this year don't care who gets how many but that's what I want for my strikers but uh, the, quite a, the, it's, it's a good question about Shabani because you uh, he, he does look to be the lowest in the pecking order and he's played in the Carabao well. <laughs> but sorry. lowest that isn't called Nelson Oliveira <laughs> well a very, good, a very good point and actually you know if you look at the names who weren't even in the 18 last night reflection of how good our squad is Oliveira being one of them but, um, but yeah I, I, so Benny you know, plays a different type of game and you know, I don't you know we are not that's, he's a plan B guy so I suspect he's going to he's not going to contribute massively to that total but Puki and, and Rhodes are, are, are generating a friendly rivalry between each other and that's good um, Team, team Puki is obviously out injured at the moment uh, Jordan Rhodes won't be able to play against Sheffield Wednesday because of course it's his loan and parent club all I'm saying is I think Timu might be fit enough for Hillsborough when it rocks up uh, Barry Newman good evening Michael I must say I thought Farker was a mistake at the start of the season but hats off to him development of youth there is a buzz around the club that has been missing for four seasons the results are churning we, results we are churning are unreal future looks good Julian Cannum would like to see Daniel Farker rewarded with a new contract soon he deserves one for sure it's an interesting situation the longer it goes on for everyone um, and there we go so uh, let's move on uh, it is a uh, this is going to be a little bit tricky because of course Brentford are playing tonight at Preston and when we're talking about you know a three or four game a day turnaround and a long trip to Preston that extra 24 hours probably does make a little bit of a difference. Yeah, particularly, well, I, I don't know how they plan to travel, whether they've, whether they've flown. Um, I mean, 24 hours can't make a huge amount of difference. Obviously, it's a big commute, but, you know, if they've flown, perhaps that's only taken an hour or whatever. So, 
you know, it's a bit of a moot point. But, um, I mean, we've found we've been playing on Wednesdays. Um, back in previous years, we've had utterly ridiculous trips to Newcastle on Tuesday and Wednesday nights. Um, I can't remember how we came up fared after that. But, um, well, it's something you've got to treat as an advantage. That's probably something you'd be telling... Um, Dan, you, Daniel Fark would be telling the lads, you know, get get down their throats, make make that extra twenty four hours of of rest by um, count. And there is a psychology. I appreciate this might be out of date in two in two hours time, but there is a psychology. If Brentford lose again, having lost the first game since Dean Smith's departure, I, I can't see how that wouldn't play on their minds a little bit. Oh, absolutely, and yeah, you know that this the coach is highly regarded, but he's coming into a new country. He's going to have to. You know, establish. You know, he can't come in like somebody like Dean Smith and say, "Okay, you know, I know this division. I know you guys. I've watched you play. Here's what I understand about you." He's having to start from scratch. So if they don't win. If they win tonight, then maybe the the players will be like, "Okay, this guy's got something. Let's get behind them on Saturday and really give it a go." But if they lose, you know, even if they draw, there's going to be question marks and there's going to be stats for to exploit. But I think the the thing about Norwich now is just like it's about consistency it's about they know they can do it now that's the great thing they can do it so you've just got to stay confident stick to the game plan and you know give your best every week and it's something we know they can do that they've been trying to do for more than a year so we kind of have known what they've been trying to do and that's a, that's a very good foundation going forward uh, let's have a look at the 11s that these guys would uh, play if they were in the dugout on uh, Saturday it gets a bit easier this time of of the season when everything's going well. Uh, Paul, we haven't got yours in front of you. Should we do, who's are we doing first, Dan? Dave's. Dave's first. Okay, so Dave, we have got yours in front of you. Um, tell us. I wouldn't change a thing. Um, what about Alex Tetty? New dad, Alex Tetty? Well, um, I'm kind of... I'm a bit old school when it comes to team selection. I kind of believe that unless you absolutely positively have to and if your hand is forced, don't change a, um, a winning team, which the team did just win. Tom Tribal didn't really do anything particularly wrong. Um, obviously, Alex Tetty didn't do anything wrong um, to lose his place. You know, that can't be helped. But, um, you know, perhaps he might not have too much sleep in the next 48, 60, you know, 16 me hours. Yes. Still yeah. still more than your two hours, though, Dave. Is it true? Yeah, well, probably not. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I don't see any reason to change anything. Um, and, you know, Tom Tribal, if he'd have come in and had a howler, you'd understand... Um, putting Teddy back in but what signal does that kind of what message did that put across to him that he's come in he's had a decent game he's called up on at the very 11th hour and he did a job so you know let him keep his place um, I think Thomas Fra- I think Thomas Frank was assistant to Dean Smith while he was manager so he's been there a little bit but they are apparently according to Rod Cooper already 1-0 down that's exactly right I apologise I apologise that's, that's a... but they are already 1-0 down at Preston so you know well, take, take it as maybe, you go. Maybe, it's a, maybe it will come to pass anyway. Yeah, I mean... Uh, Let's have a look at Paul's 11, shall we? Dan, let's pop that up. Can you remember what it is, Paul? Yeah, I, can, it I can. I mean, I just, I just basically, you know, I, I basically agree 100% with what, what Dave says. But just, you know, i probably put Teddy back in because he's just been totemic. He's the guy who kind of like... It, obviously, Farker trusts him an awful lot, but he's a link of continuity in the team and he's... He, 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 he's played in Norwich a long time and, and knows what it's about. And, Ted, and, and, I, I am going to use Tetemic at some point over the course of the season. Hey, nice, nice. nice. <laughs> but I, I just, um, I like Onel Hernandez. And I, I just, I'd like to see him get back because I think when he's on, you know, he's on the, if he's on the format, he was at the beginning of the season, he's a real weapon. He makes a real difference and he offers something that we don't have elsewhere in the attacking lineup, which is lightning pace and so I'd just give Todd Campbell a rest not because he's done anything wrong but because I think Wendy is still finding his feet a little bit more and might add maybe being in but you know six or one half a dozen or the other which sums up the championship perfectly uh, I think we're done that, that was um, great stuff let's just get a key man and predictions then for the Brentford game so a key man Dave and your prediction unpredictably key man Morris Light now um, prediction 2-1 again um, key man I think Steeperman. I think if yeah, uh, I think I think if Steeperman uh, if Steeperman's on his game, then then he can make a difference. And uh, I, I think it'll be uh, one 0 Norwich. Right. Clean sheet. Been a while. Yeah. Um, Marco Steeperman. What a man. We should do. We should do a special show for him uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, that is us. Uh, it 
for us, from us, for tonight. It's been a long day. Uh, remember, you can catch this show and all our superb Norwich City coverage over at the Pinkin Facebook page, the Pinkin YouTube channel, but first and foremost, Pinkin.com. I will be at Carroll Road on Saturday alongside Paddy Davitt and David Freezer, as well as uh, at Dean Court, uh, is what I'm calling it, for Tuesday's Carabao Cup adventure to the South Coast. So make sure you keep tabs on Pinkin.com for all the build-up, uh, reaction, analysis, team news, live coverage, anything you want uh, during what is going to be a busy week and if you see us around please do come along and uh, pop up and say hello and we'll be back here again next Wednesday evening from 7pm live at the Woolpack on Golden Ball Street in the centre of Norwich for another Pink and Show with all the usual fun and games so please join us then be it in the flesh or of course online uh, and remember keep going Paul if you want us to come uh, to your local pub be it uh, or local be it pub cafe chilling room uh, or if you want to be one of our fan pundits just get in touch send an email to thepinkenarchin.co.uk and we will do all the rest uh, in the meantime it's a huge thank you to everyone to our guests tonight to Paul and to David you enjoy it both yeah? loved it absolutely do it again. we'll do it again I hope thank you so much for coming uh, to the wall pack thanks Dan uh, to the crew which is Dan uh, thanks Dan and of course uh, to you guys for watching and getting involved we really do appreciate your time uh, we will see you again next week until then may this lovely bubble never burst because that's how football works right yeah good night <laughs>